That as people observe the fruit in our lives, and as they hear the gospel from our lips, they say, I want to be like you. Because you are like him. Do our lives draw people to Jesus? Or drive people away from Jesus? It's an important question. Now I'm going to insert here what is a sermon illustration, but in some ways it is a commercial. So if you need to run to the refrigerator or to the bathroom, now is the time to do it. Just as if you were watching TV at home. If you read the newsletter that Kara puts out monthly, this last month, or March, I made reference to a small group network. Now churches have done small groups for two millennia. That's how the church originally met, folks. <laughs> they didn't have buildings like this and pews to come and sit on. They met in one another's homes. If you read the 16th chapter of the book of Romans, it's simply filled with greetings. Paul says, say hi to so-and-so and say hi to this person, names that I have a hard time pronouncing. And to the church that meets in his home, in her home. I want to run, just as I said, there's two tracks to this fruit, character and evangelism or reproduction of Christianity. Two tracks. The first one is simply a small group gathering of no more than ten in homes to study the Word together and encourage each other in the ways of discipleship. You may have heard Billy Adams reference small group from this pulpit when he was giving meditations a couple of times. I have a small group that is a, a test run. It's filled with guinea pigs. <laughs> and so far, it's going pretty good, I think. I want you to prayerfully consider this. Number one, hey, I would like to or I would like not to participate. Just to be a participant in a small group. Yes, no. Give that some thought and give some prayer to it. Secondly, Maybe I could host a small group. And by host, I simply mean open up your home and allow every other week, so that's primarily twice a month, except for those odd months when you get three, and allow people to come into my home, no more than ten, including ourselves. Thirdly, could I be, am I equipped to be, and am I willing to be a facilitator? And I use the word facilitator rather than teacher. Teaching conjures up the idea of what I'm doing now. We come together and we've sung and we've prayed and we're going to share in the Lord's Supper. But when it's sermon time, Bill speaks and everyone else listens. The small group is not a setting where someone's simply going to come and sit around your kitchen table and you're going to do all the talking and they listen. It's conversation. It's dialogue. The first book, and maybe you've read this book, and it's an older book, a guy named Francis Chan, bald-headed Chinese guy. He's great. I love listening to him. And it was called Crazy Love. You have two weeks to read one chapter. Anybody can do that. And when you come together, the facilitator simply says, in your reading these last two weeks, what challenged you? What did you learn? What convicted you? What questions were raised? What do you disagree with? And the group gets to converse around that. The only time you might need to teach is if someone gets really weird and starts denying the deity of Christ. And then you might have to step in and say, hey, that's errant and we don't want to go down the paths of error. So maybe you want to be a facilitator. I want to be a participant, a host, a facilitator. Within the next couple of weeks, there will be sign-up sheets and things like that. And I'd just like you to see if that's something that you would like to do. Why does this have any value? It's designed to nurture your faith so that you grow in Christ as His disciple and that the fruit of Christian character comes to greater maturity and is sweet. Now with that one, 
There's a second tract, and we're not quite ready to go here yet, but after we've run through a little bit of our own growth, before the end of this year, I want to start a second group, a set of small groups, that are only you and maybe one max of two other couples from the church. We don't want to overwhelm people with a bunch of Christians who descend upon them, but this is for outreach. This is for reproduction, Christians making Christians. How many of you went to ICOM, the International Conference on Missions in Peoria, maybe three, four years ago? I can't remember. If th th There was one night the speaker was talking about, he was a preacher, and I think he was in Texas. I can't remember. It doesn't matter. But he was talking about how he and his wife would take their lawn chairs and sit in the driveway. Instead of going on the back porch, they would come out so they could engage their neighbors. And as they talked to their neighbors, neighbors began coming over and having their lawn chairs, and they would simply sit in the driveway, and they would talk and get to know each each other and he and his wife are drinking a coke or a pepsi or whatever surely not mountain dew that stuff's gross and their neighbors would come over with their beer and they're sitting there well, you know what do you do i work for cat what do you do oh i'm a school teacher what do you do i'm retired what do you do i'm a preacher you're, you're what a preacher one more i'm a preacher and the beer goes behind the back you know <laughs> uh oh have i been judged and he said what began to happen is the neighbors would come over and then one of the neighbors actually said, well, as long as we're all sitting here, why don't you tell us about that Bible thing that you preach? And they began to have just informal, informal Bible studies on their driveway. And, and the guy, the, the, the drinker guy goes, you know, we should give this a name. Let's call it the Bible and the beer. And the preacher goes, could we call it something else? You know, you know how we Christians get. And he said, over time, they wound up with about six, I can't remember the numbers exactly, but about six families from the street, from their cul-de-sac, who would meet just about weekly, just set out and talk about Jesus. And from that six, four or five actually wound up coming to the church, coming to Jesus and being baptized into him, and having life changes. Isn't that cool? You know, it was no big program. It was no big, hey, we're going to, you know. So often in the past, churches have programmed sharing Jesus. Now, we share Jesus in the course of life. Just in the course of life. Because you're my neighbor and I care about you and I want to be your friend and I want to share Jesus with you. Not because you're a project. I want you to give consideration to, would you, when the time is right, open up your driveway or your living room to you and another couple from church, or if you're single, you and three or four other people from the church gathering together at your home, but specifically inviting people in your circle of relationships, coworkers, friends, family members who don't know Jesus. This isn't the time to say, hey, I know you go to Northwoods. We're having a Bible study at my house. How about you come? No, they go to Northwoods. This is about... And don't say this to them. You're an abject pagan. You're going to go to hell. Come to my house so I can teach you about Jesus. But that's who we're talking about, the abject pagans. Okay? Don't ask your church friends. Ask your non-church friends. We want to introduce them to Jesus. And that's the sole goal. It's not to talk about all the nuances of Christianity. Can we talk transubstantiation, consubstantiation, and symbolism in the Lord's Supper. No. That's not the point of our gathering tonight. We want to talk about Jesus, who He is, because I want you to know Him. You see the difference? So, commercial's over. If you're still out, in the fridge area, time to come back in. The game is about to resume. Please give some prayer to what your part in a small group network would be. There is a third character, and the third character is the Father. Jesus is my Father, is the vine dresser. I love this. 
Now there is a bit of warning here. He says that those that do not produce fruit, he gathers up the dry, the dead, the disconnected branches, and he throws them on the burn pile. That's the kind way of saying there is a day of reckoning, and there is a judgment, and there is a hell. But Jesus' purpose here is not to scare us into some kind of obedience. His purpose here is to show us the hand of the Father who dresses the vine. And the whole purpose of dressing the vine is to create greater sweetness. Greater sweetness. Just like my dad pruning that vine in the backyard of his house. Boggling my mind, but he would take off those, those branches that were just rambling everywhere. Have you ever seen a vine that's not been cared for? And all of a sudden, everything's tangled up. God comes into our lives and he prunes away that which would entangle us. He prunes away our sin, our selfishness, our misdirection in life. And he says, let me help you be who I created you to be. Let me bring into your life a fullness of humanity. The way I created your original parents, Adam and Eve, to be. Let me redeem you and recreate you and restore you. That's what his pruning's about. And notice that it is the Father who is the vine dresser. One of the things that I do not want to do, I do not want to send you out of here this morning thinking, great, one more thing that preacher wants me to do. How do I fit this into my schedule? Have you ever left church feeling that way? That's all, that's all the preacher tends to do is tell me how to use my time. And I don't have any more to give. Now, I don't want to talk about doing. I want to talk about being. And there is a difference. All kinds of people do things without being what it is. When I was in high school, I played baseball. I wasn't a baseball player. You get what I'm saying? I was on the team. I played. I had a great glove. I was a late-inning defensive replacement because my bat was non-existent. My junior year... Those of you who know baseball, any Cub Cardinal fans here? Okay, Pat. What's a good batting average? 350. Man, you're pushing it, baby. My junior year, my batting average was zero, zero, zero. I got no hits. My strikeout percentage as a batter, not as a pitcher, because I was an outfielder, my strikeout percentage was 1,000%. I struck out every time I stepped to the plate. That's why I was a late inning replacement. My junior year, my coach had me in late innings, and I came up to bat in the ninth inning. My friends, my friends in the stands, I heard them say, oh, no. My friends... There are Christians, there are Christians who do things without being a disciple. And I hope that makes sense to you. I'm not talking about, oh golly, go do something more. I simply want you to be attached to the vine so that his life-giving sap, if you will, can flow into your veins and into your arteries and can produce a fruit that brings glory to God. Because look at verse 8, my Father is glorified by this. See, this isn't about you and me being great evangelists and someone putting our name on a plaque. This is about God being glorified because He has redeemed mankind. To God be the glory, great things He has done. Even our prayers, verse 7, is so often taken out of context. If you abide in me, my words abide in you. Ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Awesome! Awesome! Aaron comes to church now and he and Allie put their membership here and he sells Jaguars. God, may I have a Jaguar. That is not what verse 7 is about, folks. In context, it's about what? Bearing fruit. 
God, soften the hearts and open the eyes of my non-Christian family members and friends. God, open the door of opportunity that I might be a witness to them, that they might be a part of the fruit that naturally flows from my being connected to the vine. And he says, that'll happen. It's awesome. Because it is the work of God. God is the vine dresser. Again, sometimes we just think, boy, if I try harder, if I do more, let me take you one more time to the backyard of my folks' house in Paris, Illinois. Not once did the shears come out of the garage on their own and chop off dead branches. My father took the shears and pruned the vine. Spiritually, our eternal Father takes the shears and does the pruning. Our call is simply this. Stay connected to the vine. Because if you remain in the vine, you'll have life. And you'll produce fruit. If you separate from the vine, you dry and wither and he'll have to prune you off. And that's not what he wants. For he takes no delight when the wicked perish. I hope I've made sense today. If I haven't, let me encourage you simply to read verses 1 through 8 of John 15. Jesus makes far more sense than I ever shall. Can I read verse 8 one more time? My Father is glorified by this, that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Glory to the Father. To what vine are you attached? What vine do you abide in? The vine which is the true vine, Jesus, or some other vine that this world would set before us? What is the fruit of your life? What is your life producing in terms of character and your impact upon other people? What does your life say about you and your discipleship? Does it prove that you are truly His disciple? And let me throw one last thought at you. As you do that kind of introspection, Ask that question about yourself of someone else. Ask someone who knows you well and who loves you enough to be honest with you. When you look at my life, what is its fruit? What does it look like? Can you tell I'm a Christian? And how can you tell I'm a Christian? And is my fruit still relatively immature, like in the spring, or is it come to a sweetness of maturity, like these grapes down here? Because when we look at ourselves in the mirror, yes, sometimes we see our blemishes. Ah, oh, there's a blemish, or there's a scar, but it's, it's not so bad. But when you ask someone who knows you and loves you and will be honest with you, they're apt to say, well, Bill, you're a train wreck. Right, Rich? <laughs> oh, first service? Yeah, you chicken. For <laughs> First service, Rich is sitting over and he says, yeah, Bill, you're a train wreck, all right. <laughs> I am, yeah, who said that? I am a Bills fan. I am a Bills fan and a Sabres fan. But the Illini beat the Hawkeyes. My torn tensions between Illinois and Iowa. And when someone says to me, Bill... There is bitterness. Bill, there is anger. Bill, there is selfishness. And these things are not bringing glory to the Father. I'll be honest, I don't like to hear that. It hurts. But I need to hear that. And what I then do is I humbly, on my knees, say, Father, would you get the shears out? 
I need some pruning. There's some branches in my life that are drawing life-giving sap away from good, sweet fruit to things which are ugly and unhealthy. Would you prune me? And he does. Not with a viciousness, but with the love and the tender hand of the vine dresser who cares for his vineyard. I'd ask you to stand, let's sing, but answer those questions. To what are you connected? What vine are you connected to? What is the fruit of your life? And what is a proof about whose disciple you are? be seated. Rich is going to lead us to the Lord's table, one of those places where we can stay connected to the vine. Well, Bill brought the lesson today, the message. I, uh, I was reminded, and I'm going against my wife's better judgment. <laughs> this is a true story. He was, uh, we, he was talking about the, the branches and the pruning and such. We were in the side room many years ago. We had an elder by the name of Ken Bunton. And I don't remember the context, but Ken was talking about, about his grapes that he was growing. And he had taken an axe to it and tore it out, tore out the grapevine, said <laughs> why, he said, those, those grape, or that grapevine has disappointed me for the last time. <laughs> so, and I'm thinking, goodness, I understand the, the, the pruning, we want God to prune away the sin, but I hope it doesn't get so bad that he takes an ax and, and takes it out. So, anyway, th thank you. <laughs> Okay, Genesis 22.2 says, take your, take your son, your only son, yes, Isaac, whom you love so much, and go to the land of Moriah. Go and sacrifice him as a burnt offering on one of the mountains, which I will show you. Uh, as we, uh, in a couple of minutes here, we'll prepare for uh, the uh, taking communion. Just go ahead and get, get ready, but just wait, and we'll all take it together. Uh, I saw another article uh, and uh, come across email. It was about a familiar Old Test Testament story that really struck a chord with me, and uh, I just wanted to share it. Kind of goes along with Bill's sermon last week, where he talked about loving God more than than uh, others, your family, and, and even yourself. God tells Abraham to sacrifice his beloved son, and uh, the author said, "Well." Why would God ask such a thing? And he said, well, if, if I were Abraham, I would have searched for excuses to not sacrifice my son. Like, God, doesn't this go against your promise? Or shouldn't you ask my wife about her thoughts? Um, and uh, if I'm asked to sacrifice our son, I, I can't ignore her opinions, can I? 
And what would happen if I told my neighbors that I sacrificed my son when they asked me, uh, hey, wh where's your son? I haven't seen him in a while. And, uh, you know, in this day and age, you talk about child abuse, that would not be good. And uh, is it even right to sacrifice a person in the first place? And for, and for myself, I could say, I, I could come up with a lot of questions and, and excuses, excuses myself, but, uh, and uh, one of them might even be, God, is that you talking to me, to asking me to do that, or is that Satan? But I'm, I'm sure in my mind that with, with, uh, if, if God wanted me to do that, I have faith that he would make it very clear that it was him talking to me and, uh, and only him. But Abraham, he obeyed God. And when he uh, obeyed God by acting in faith, God uh, showed him that a ram could be sacrificed in place of his son, Isaac. And uh, then many years later, God uh, also prepared another uh, sacrifice, and that was his own beloved son, Jesus, who died uh, in our place and is the Savior of the world. Jesus gave up his own life to pay the price for, for our sins and to give us eternal life. God's thoughtful, and he, and he prepares ahead of time for our future. It's really a blessing to be able to trust him and believe in him. So, uh, I'm going to ask you, just remember at this time that Jesus is the Lamb of God who is sacrificed for our sins, and, and keep that in mind as we partake of these emblems. Dear Lord, we just thank you for sending Jesus down the cross and, and providing a, a way for us to have eternal life with, with you, Lord. Help us to always remember that Jesus is the ultimate sacrifice and, and he's worthy of our, of our constant praise and, uh, and worship. And God, we thank you for your, just your awesome forgiveness and and your grace, and we give you all the praise and glory, and it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. We're so happy that you were able to join us both um, in person and online. Uh, please remember to stay in your pews until you're dismissed. Please do not congregate in the foyer. Please be mindful of people's personal space. Um, and I think that's it. So if you would please stand to sing with us. <laughs> 